Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the online worship of the First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor. Wherever you are, we are delighted you are with us here today. Today is the day that God has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please enjoy the amazing talent of... Good morning and best wishes on Easter Sunday to the entire First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor. My name is Mark Shermer. I'm the chair of the Board of the Trustees. Tam and I have been members of this church for more than 20 years now. Our sons grew up in the church and we've enjoyed our time here, the many Sundays in the pews and the many mission trips together. I've managed the annual stewardship campaign in the past and I've been a deacon on and off for as long as I can remember. To me, the First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor is a great positive force for good in the Ann Arbor community. It's a beacon of God's love, hope, and Christian freedom. Everything our church stands for and everything it does makes me proud to be a member and to actively support its many ministries. I'm a believer that our community needs more places that welcome everyone, more places that embrace every human as an equal, no matter what their story might be. To me, the First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor is exactly that. It's a family dedicated to doing God's work in the community to make it better every day. Each year, as the stewardship season comes around, we're fortunate to be able to support such a great church, a great community, and a positive force in Ann Arbor. I love this quote, happiness doesn't come from what you get, happiness comes from what you give. In giving my time, giving my financial support to the First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor is an important part of my life. It's a part of who I am, and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity. Thank you to everybody who's joined us here today for online worship and everybody and everything you do to support our community. Thank you for being a part of the First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor, and cheers to you all. I do look forward to seeing you in church, in person, sometime later this year.
Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. We are so glad that you are joining us for worship today, and we are inspired by that beautiful prelude music that we just heard. I was thinking before the service how a year ago we were making videos for our online worship services from our various homes. I never, ever imagined, never imagined that we would still be worshiping virtually uh, this Easter, but we are. But the good news is, is that God is with us wherever we are, and because of the abilities that we now have virtually, we are still a gathered community this day, and I am so glad that you have joined us today for worship. With the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, God's name is to be praised. And the good news of this Easter day is Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. So let us worship God together.
Happy Easter. Please join me in this morning's call to worship and prayer of invocation, followed by our Lord's Prayer and our Gloria Patri. Easter begins in darkness and despair. The one, the one whom, whom we loved, loved and, and followed, followed is, is missing. missing. We wonder who will roll away the heavy stone of our anguish and hopelessness for us. It, it is, is all too, too much, much for us to bear. Then Easter takes us by surprise. The bright light of hope and possibility arrives and becomes our new norm. Yes, yes Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. In joy and with one voice, let us pray. Giver, Giver of, of new life, life we, we come, come to, to worship this Easter, Easter morning with alleluias and songs of praise on our lips. lips. We come to proclaim and affirm the wonder of Jesus' resurrection. Because Jesus Christ is raised from the tomb, we can now live with hope and with the promise that Christ's resurrection power can enter into each of our lives today to lift and transform us. Be with us this morning, loving God. Be present with us as we consider once again the mystery, the mystery and, and magnificence, magnificence of, of the new life you offer, you offer us. us. We pray, we pray these, these things in the name, in the name of Jesus, Jesus, who taught us when praying to say, to say together, together, Our Father, who art in heaven, in heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead, and lead us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the It was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. morning. At this time, I'd like to invite all the kids to gather around for Children's Circle. So first of all, happy Easter, friends. I hope you're all having a wonderful Easter. So I received this little Easter basket. I know some of you also have little goodies for Easter. And I want to see what I got in my Easter basket. Let's see. There's grass. That's not helpful. Ah, more grass. Let's see. What else did we get? Ah, goodies. Let's see, the yellow or green, pink egg. Oh, I'll start with a pink one. What do you think's in the pink egg? Oh, I got some candy. Oh, I'll eat that later. Maybe I'll share a little with a friend. Oh, there's green. Oh, there's chocolate inside. Awesome. Let's see, oh, the yellow one. I love the bright yellow one. Oh, there's nothing in my yellow Easter egg. Let's talk about a story today with something else that's empty. So... We have been talking all about Jesus, and we, we know that Jesus died, and they took his body, and they wrapped it in a cloth, and they put it in a tomb, and they rolled this big rock in front of the tomb, and they even put a soldier there to make sure nobody messed with the tomb. Well, today in our story, there are these ladies that they've been friends with Jesus, and they want to go take care of the body properly. So they go to the tomb, and they don't know how they're going to roll the, the stone away because it's really big, heavy stone that's blocking the tomb. And when they get there, they find it's empty. The stone's been rolled away. Nothing's in the tomb except they see a young man in a white, glowing outfit. And he tells them, the person you're looking for isn't here. And they get scared. What would you do if that happened to you? They get terrified, so they run away. But the good news is that one by one, Jesus starts to show himself to the disciples and to his friends, 
and they start to see Jesus. He's alive. He's not dead in the tomb. And so today on Easter, we celebrate that Jesus is alive. And then we get to celebrate as we keep going on the more cool and awesome things that Jesus does with his friends. But let's pray together. Will you pray with me? Dear God, dear God, thank you for Easter. Thank you for Easter. And for the news. And for the news. That Jesus is alive. That Jesus is alive. Amen. Amen. I'm getting, I'm getting my mess later. All good gifts, whether they're something like this or something like this, come from you, O oh God. For you have given us life, and in Jesus and in the empty tomb, you've given us new life. As you have gifted us, we now share our gifts with you and with the ministry to which you have called us. With grateful and hopeful hearts, we now share of our offerings. Good morning, everyone, and happy Easter. Um, he is risen, and indeed, he is risen. For my musical offering, I wanted to offer something that leans on the side of inner joy, of anticipation and excitement for the light and warmth that the season of Easter brings us. Usually during this season, I always think of that chorus from Felix Mendelssohn's Elijah, he watches over Israel, slumbers not nor sleeps. And I think that while he watches over us, he invites us to dream as well. For me, in my dreams during this time, they are the culmination of beliefs, desires, struggles, and triumphs. But in the world with no limits, and perhaps now, we can finally start seeing dreams of what our world can look like after this pandemic. And I invite you, my friends, to let this season be full of dreams of indescribable joy, of dreams fulfilled, and to wake with your life renewed. This is Amy Beach's Dreaming.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Let us pray. Generous and surprising God, when we thought that death had claimed your only son, you amazed us with the resurrection. Surprise us once again with your ability to turn our humble offerings into gifts that will transform the world through our witness to your love. We lay all that we have at your feet, O God, knowing that you will use us to embody the gospel for the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we hear our Easter story from the Gospel of Mark in the 16th chapter. We'll be reading verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord for all people. Amen. Will you please join me now in prayer? Let us pray. Oh God, on this Easter Sunday, as we celebrate the empty tomb, startle us once again with your indescribable love that seeks us always, that always can dispel darkness, and that indeed helps us to do what on our own might be impossible. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts this day be acceptable and pleasing to you. Amen. Easter isn't an anomaly. It's an incongruity. It's 
It's a holy mystery. Author Walter Wink calls Easter an affront, a riddle, and a challenge. It was certainly that and very much more for the disciples of Jesus on that first Easter Sunday morning. As a matter of fact, I can just picture the headlines of the Jerusalem newspaper that historic Saturday so long ago. The headlines may have read, charismatic leader crucified, there is no chance of survival. Honestly, it is very difficult for us to fully imagine the total despair and the confusion which gripped the disciples of Jesus after Jesus had exhaled his last breath on that cross. Just think, here is the one for whom they had given up literally everything, friends and family, their careers. Here is the one who modeled such freedom and conviction, who himself was later arrested and tried and crucified. Here was the one who lived and taught as no one else had ever quite done, who talked about love and mercy and the power of faith and talked about the promise of new life. Here was the one on whom they had attached their hopes and dreams and trust, who had just died the death of a common criminal. For three years, they had followed Jesus wherever he had gone. For three amazing and very confusing years, they had seen those who were helpless and those who had been cast aside, touched and healed. For three years, they had seen the powers of empire confronted and challenged. And for three years, they had seen the lowly, the imperfect, and even the disenfranchised given value and extended human dignity and offered to them second chances and new starts. In fact, they never ceased to be utterly dumbfounded and even confused by Jesus' words and by his actions. But here now, their charismatic leader, their beloved Jesus, their friend, was now dead. And they were left alone. And they were left without any sense of purpose as shocked and as dismayed as they were about the events that brought Jesus to his very tragic and fatal finish, they never, 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 ever expected anything more to happen. They thought the story was finished and they certainly weren't looking for a resurrection. Jesus was dead. Their hopes were shattered. And again, they thought it was the very end of the story period. So it was that first Easter morning that the empty tomb took all of Christ's followers and friends by absolute and total surprise. After all, we just don't expect the dead to come alive again, do we? So let me take a few minutes this morning to unpack our gospel reading from Mark for us. After the death of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, a very wealthy and, and a very religious man and a member of the Sanhedrin that had condemned Jesus, went to the Roman authority and claimed the body of Jesus. Along with the help of Nicodemus, the two of them wrapped Jesus' body in a fine linen cloth. And then they laid him in a newly built tomb that was purchased by Joseph. Now, because it was almost sunset that dark Friday afternoon, the two of them rolled the heavy stone across the opening of the tomb, and then they went home to prepare for the Sabbath. Now, because of the Sabbath, there hadn't been enough time to render proper burial services to the body of Jesus. Therefore, after the Sabbath, some of the women who had followed Jesus decided to go back to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body with burial spices, as was the custom of that day. So as early as possible on Sunday morning, these three very devoted women set out to perform this very sad but very important task. However, on their way to the tomb that morning, these women are sharing their concern about the one very important particular thing and that is that tombs have no front doors in which to enter. 
which means the only way that they could get in or out of the tomb was to move that large circular heavy stone that was in front of the tomb. And these women knew that they just didn't have the strength to be able to move the stone on their own and were worried about it. However, as the story goes, when these three women reached the tomb and to their absolute and utter amazement, the stone had already been rolled away. The tomb was open. And not only that, but inside the tomb was this heavenly messenger who told these three devoted women the shocking news that Jesus wasn't there, but that Jesus had risen from the dead. Don't be afraid, the young man in a white robe said to them. I know you're looking for Jesus who is nailed to a cross, but he's not here. He is risen. So go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going on ahead of you now into Galilee and there you will see him just as he told you. Now please be aware, such news did not immediately lift their spirits. They did not begin to sing as we did earlier this morning, Christ the Lord is risen today. No, such news was actually a very terrifying and a very troubling surprise to these three women. Here they and all the other followers had presumed, and obviously for good reason, that Jesus was dead. These three women may have been able to manage the thought of Jesus having been taken away or, or maybe even stolen, but the idea that Jesus might be alive again? Well, that was just really too much for them to handle, as I think it would also be very difficult for us to handle such news as that as well. Then sometime even later, when the women told Peter and the other disciples this remarkable news, the disciples' response was very similar to the response of these three women. Astonishment is what they were feeling. Confusion marked their reactions. For after all, as one person once said, what do you really do with a 33-year-old who just won't let the story end? I believe, like the earlier followers of Jesus, Easter probably, to some level, scares us and it bewilders us as well. You see, we are also the ones who have a hard time believing. We are also the ones who aren't quite sure what to do with this idea of an empty tomb. We are also the ones who ask ourselves if we really have faith, really have faith in God's power to show up among us when we don't expect God to be there. We are also the ones who have a difficult time trusting such incredible and confusing news about Jesus and then letting ourselves believe in a kind of love that just won't go away, that will always be there for us. In fact, that can leave a tomb empty. In fact, a kind of love and a kind of presence that won't leave us alone or in our own tombs. We're a, we're a little bit like the Reverend Clint Tidwell. Writer and preacher Tom Long tells this wonderful story of Reverend Tidwell, who was the pastor of a very small church in a very small southern town. Well, apparently one of Tidwell's church members was the 80-year-old owner and very active editor of the local small town newspaper. Therein resided, according to Long, both a blessing and a curse. According to Long, the blessing part was that the old journalist believed Reverend Tidwell to be one of the finest preachers that he had ever heard, and thus wishing the whole town now to benefit from Tidwell's homiletical expertise and wisdom, the old journalist would publish a summary of Tidwell's sermons every Monday morning uh, in the local newspaper. The curse part was that this journalist, though he was well-meaning and well-intentioned would often, often derive interpretations of Tidwell's sermons uh, that were quite different than what Reverend Tidwell had thought that he had preached on a particular Sunday morning. Reverend Tidwell's deepest amazement and embarrassment, however, came not when the newspaper editor misunderstood his Sunday sermon, but much to the contrary when he understood his sermon all too sharply and too clearly. 
So it was on the Monday morning after Easter one year when Reverend Tidwell was in his bathrobe and his slippers and walking out to his back door to retrieve his morning newspaper that he saw the paper and he noticed the headline for the morning paper was larger than it usually would ever be. At first he wondered what it could be. Had a tragedy occurred perhaps over the weekend that was being highlighted or, or had a new cure for cancer finally been discovered? As Tidwell drew close enough to read the headline, uh, he was startled to read the words, Reverend Tidwell claims that Jesus actually rose from the, grave, uh, from the grave, from the tomb. Well, at first, I guess a red flush crept up Tidwell's neck. Yes, of course, he had claimed in Sunday's Easter sermon that Christ rose from the tomb, that he had rose from the dead. But, but really, after all, as a preacher, you're, you're supposed to say that. And on Easter, you're especially supposed to say that, aren't you? Aren't you supposed to say that Christ rose from the dead? It's not like saying some person who died last week had risen from the grave, is it? Well, suddenly, as Reverend Tidwell looked at this screaming, bolded headline, what had been a routine Easter sermon had Tidwell now feeling rather foolish. As Tidwell thought about it, Easter is foolish. This resurrection of Jesus is foolish. In fact, he thought, Easter is the very foolishness of our great God and the foolishness of the wonderful good news. This amazing and mysterious and very radical idea that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Like Tidwell, I think the good news of Easter also really shocks us. We don't know what to do with that kind of news. Perhaps it's because we, like the friends and followers of Jesus so long ago, are people who are very much aware of the realities of life. And I think because of that, we are sometimes the people who can't quite believe you see, the reality of Easter and of the resurrection power of Jesus does not reside in a careful explanation of all the facts, nor in our trying to impose a kind of literal interpretation onto this Easter event, nor in our pushing a kind of blind or non-intellectual kind of faith. No, the reality of Easter and the resurrection power of Jesus lives in the arena of faith. For if Jesus did not in some profound way rise from the dead, if something dramatic had not happened back 2,000 years ago, whether it's literal or metaphorical, then it is very likely that the disciples and followers would have simply walked away or faded away, and we would never have heard of Jesus at all. Something startling and amazing and mysterious and magnificent must have happened in that first Easter event. Some time ago, I picked up the book, God, the Evidence, an interesting book by Patrick Glynn. Glynn is a Harvard-trained philosopher who earned his undergraduate and PhD degrees from Harvard in the 1970s, so he's around my age. Glenn was schooled in the modern secular viewpoint of his day and was at one time himself a convinced atheist. Glenn had come to believe that reason was the only real pathway to truth, that all notions of God or gods were, were merely fictitious or fictions, or they were simply human conventions that human beings in their ignorance had mistaken for nature or for reality. Yet, Unbeknownst to Glenn, at the very time he was plumbing the depths of philosophical nihilism, science itself was beginning to take a surprising new turn. Science was beginning to refute the original premise of a random universe, a mystery that we're still trying to contend with today. 
So to make a long story short, Glenn began to discover in this time of change or in these events, a spiritual side to himself. In fact, as Glenn began to explore the realities or the lack of reality of God, and as he sought to bring definition to these experiences that he was now having, Glenn found and then he experienced the presence he felt of a living God, of a living presence that was there with him. And he discovered in these experiences a very vital and personal new faith in God. He was no longer considering himself an atheist, but a person who believed. Glenn wrote these words. He wrote, when I did, undergrad, when I did undergraduate and graduate work at Harvard in the 1970s, for example, it was taken for granted that traditional religious beliefs were a thing of the past, invalidated by science, incompatible with a modern outlook. There were believers among the professors, of course, but the culture was agnostic. There was a certain tendency which I came to share to view religious belief and practice as manifestations of intellectual inconsistency, emotional weakness, or a lack of cultural sophistication. What one day happened to me, this discovery of the spiritual, I found is happening also to others and I believe is on the verge of happening to our culture as a whole. You see, Glenn and others understand that the reality of God and the reality of Easter and the reality of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is not found in proving some kind of factual historical data, but is noted in the changed lives of Jesus' disciples and followers, and in people just like you and me. People like you and me who have encountered and experienced the real presence of the resurrected Christ in our everyday lives by faith. I think this is how Easter becomes relevant and meaningful, us, meaningful to us today. It is by taking this leap of faith and allowing God to touch our lives in such a way that we experience the nearness and reality of God. So my friends, let's celebrate Easter today and, and let's sing our alleluias for the good news of God's amazing grace and God's amazing love that in Christ's resurrection, we are given the awesome and mysterious invitation to encounter the living God who is present in our lives today. For after all, Jesus not only conquered death, but as importantly, Jesus impacts our lives today. And now, affirming for us that life, in spite of all the odds, in spite of all the uncertainties, that life is worth living. And that in spite of what we may see or experience or even understand, that hope is always possible and hope is always present. Why? Why? Because the tomb is empty. Because Jesus lives. And because Jesus lives, we also may live life fully and abundantly and spiritually. Yes, my friends, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Thank you, choir. Thank you for the direction and creativity that you give to that choir, Darno. In the spirit of hope that Easter brings, let us join together as a faith family in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, we have arrived at this anticipated morning. We have heard the familiar song of Christ the Lord is risen today, and we have sung it, maybe hummed it, and while it brings us joy, some of us may have thought, this is not quite the same. We miss church as we knew it. 
We miss the smell of lilies and unmasked smiling faces, but still Jesus rose. We heard the familiar text of Mary seeking Jesus, but finding an empty tomb instead. We were inspired by the proclamation of the hymns and the music and the prayers. And still we might long for the pews and the beautiful light from our sanctuary windows. And yet, whether we read it on the stained glass that goes above our balcony in the back, or whether we know it in our souls, he is not here. He is risen. He lives. Because Easter happens, O oh Lord, no matter if we are seated on a pew or a couch or a bag chair in a park as the sun breaches the horizon. Easter happens if we are ready for it or not, bursting in, bidding us to celebrate the victory of life over death, of light over darkness, of hope over despair. And Lord, because he lives, we are invited to as well. For today, you invite us to new life. Today, Holy One, you invite us to live into the miracle of Easter by how we hope and how we love and how we view the world. Today is like your gift to us, this new year of our Christian year. Today, we resolve to see possibilities where others have given up. We resolve to view one another through the eyes of Christ, who never judged as the world did, but saw others through the contents of their hearts and their characters. Help us in our resolve, Holy One. Guide us back to the reality of this day when we lose sight. We pray especially today, Lord, for all those who are grieving, for whom this time of year is not full of lilies and smiles, but of memories of the one whom they wish was still among them. We pray for the millions of lives lost across our world this past year to COVID. We pray for their families, that they may continue to process their grief amidst the challenges. We give you thanks, Lord, for all those essential workers, from the cashiers at our grocery stores to the nurses in our ICU units. And we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks for light and hope in the midst of this past year. We give you thanks for not one, but three different vaccines now being administered. We give you thanks for the creativity and the technology that has allowed us to gather in different ways, to connect, to worship, to learn, and to create together. We give you thanks, O Lord, because in the midst of the darkest and strangest year, you fulfilled the promise that today is all about. Because still he rose, still he lives, still the light prevails. And so still we praise you and we celebrate our risen Lord. For it is in his precious name we pray. Amen. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, He's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ.
Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to I see his loving care, and though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading, I hear the stormy blast, the day of his appearing will come at last he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to Wow, that's a great hymn. He lives, he lives. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. So friends, go from here now in God's peace and be blessed for Christ again is risen. Christ is alive. God is with you. So be at peace. Amen.